Hello everyone and welcome to task number seven. In this task, we will understand the training process of artificial neural networks and the gradient descent algorithm. Okay, so from a very high level, how do we train these artificial neural networks? So in the previous task, in task number six, we learned how to build a multi-layer perceptor network and we learned that it essentially just a matrix and we try to find the optimal values of weights, which is what we have in here. So let me walk you through the actual training process. Now I have this network, okay? And let's assume that this network is not trained. We just started with just randomly initialized weights. So all the values of weights in here doesn't mean anything, just a bunch of random numbers. And what we do is that we take our data and we divide them, as I mentioned, into training and testing. So we take the training data, we feed them here to my model, and in general, what we do is that we have a label corresponding to every input in my training data. So for example, I have input and output. So in this example that we had in, um, in our case study, I have the image and corresponding to it, I have the key facial points. So now I have for every image, I have a corresponding label associated with it. So that's my input X and that's what we call it the desired or true output Y. And essentially what happened is, when this network initially is not trained, it will generate output, right? so generate predictions. We call these predictions Y hat. Initially, this in predictions will be garbage, basically, because why? Because all the weights here are just randomly initialized. They don't mean anything. What we do is that we calculate the error signal, which is a difference between the model predictions, which is Y hat, minus the desired or the true output Y. We calculate the error signal, and then we go back and then we update the network weights. And what happened is, similar to humans, artificial neural networks learn by experience and learn by example and learn by over time too. So you actually need to show this network, all this data over and over again, over what we call it multiple epochs, as you guys can see here. So we start with a very large error initially and over and over again, you will find that the error starts to go down and then going down, going down, and uh, you reach a state where now the model is expert, the error is almost zero, which means, which means the model predictions match already the true output or my desired output. And this is a very important point, especially for those of you guys who maybe are new to AI in general. So after we train the model, now we wanna test the model. So we take this network, okay, and then we deploy it in practice, we take it, we freeze the network weights, so all these weights are now frozen, and now I can take it and test the model performance using the testing data. And please note that the testing data is the data that the model has never seen before during training. So you take the testing data, you feed it to the network, and now you can generate new predictions, okay? So now you can, again, take the model, maybe deploy it in, in uh, uh, on a cell phone, for example, or maybe on the edge, or maybe in a car, and then you can basically test it on new images that the model has never seen before. And that's from a very high level, the training process and testing process for uh, AI models in general. So what we do in here is that I would say there are two strategies. The first one is that we take all the data and then we divide them into training and testing. We divide them to 80% training in general, and 20% for testing. Please note that the testing data, again, has never been seen by the model during training. This is very important. That's one way. The second strategy is that we can take our data and divide them into three chunks. The first one is the training data set, and that will be 60% of my data. And then I'm gonna divide them into 20% validation data set, and then 20% testing data set. Okay, so testing we know, training we know, what is validation data set? So what we try to do when we train our AI models is that we wanna make sure that these models are able to generalize. And we wanna make sure that they are not overfitting the training data. We want to make sure that basically as the network is being trained, as the error is going down in here, is that the model does not overfit the training data, which means 
I don't want the model to learn all the ins and outs, all the different nonlinearity, for example, in my data, and just works really well on only these set of images, for example. I don't want that. Why? Because in practice, you will see different images. Okay, I don't want the, the model to perform really well on the training data, but it for, performs really poorly on other data set. And that's why we take the validation data set and we, as the model is being trained every epoch, we run the model on a new data set that the model again has never seen before, which is the validation data set. As long as the error on the training data is going down and the error on the validation data is going down, if both of them are going down, that's a good sign. That means now the model is able to generalize. However, if I notice that the, the error on the training data is going down and the error on the validation data is going up, that means now the model starts to overfit my training data. Now the model is able to learn all the, basically the, um, the details of the training data and it fails to generalize and we don't want that at any cost. And then we can simply just stop the training. We can say, you know what, exit the training. I don't want to train anymore. I'm good right now. Okay. And please note that the validation data set, we can actually use it during throughout the training process. And now after the model is trained, I can simply test it on the testing data set. Okay. So let's cover the gradient descent algorithm. So essentially what we try to do is that we try to find the optimal values of my network weights. That's all what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the best values of weights that try to minimize the error. And when we train these artificial neural networks, we use a technique known as gradient descent algorithm. Essentially what we have in here, this is simply my error curve. So let's assume that I randomly initialized the network weights and I started maybe somewhere in here. So the error was really high. What I try to do is I try to basically just start to go down and try what I'm looking for is I'm trying to find the minimum point. I'm trying to find the value or the actual values of network weights that try to minimize the overall error. I want to find the minimum value. And that's where the term, I would say, gradient descent comes into play. I wanted to calculate first the gradient at any point, and I want to move in the negative direction of that gradient. I just want to go down. As long as I'm going down, that's a good thing. That means I'm trying to find the minimum point and once I reached that minimum point, now I was able to find the optimal values of weights. And again, if you guys took any course on optimization, that's essentially what we do when we try to run any optimization algorithm. We try to find the points or the values of weights or values of parameters that minimize the overall error. So gradient descent is an optimization algorithm that is used to obtain the optimized network weights and bias values. It simply works by iteratively trying to minimize the cost function. It simply works by calculating the gradient of the cost function. So we calculate the gradient at any point and we start to move in the negative direction of that gradient until the local or global minimum is achieved. Okay. And uh, essentially, if you, if you try to use the positive of the gradient, you're not going to go down, you're actually going to go up. So you will be able to achieve local or global maximum values instead. And when we train these models, we use what we call it a learning rate. Okay, if you guys remember, we covered the learning rate before when we try to train our network here. If you guys remember, I had learning rate, which is I can choose. This is essentially how aggressive you want to go down. Okay, do you want to go down aggressively, like really fast? Or do you want to take it slowly and maybe move a little bit like, you know, like slowly heading toward, heading downwards? So if the learning rate increases, the area covered in the search space will increase. That means I'm actually moving faster. I'm actually moving down. I'm updating the weights more aggressively. So we actually might reach the global minimum faster. However, the problem with this is that we can overshoot the target. So if my, if my point that I'm looking for is here and I'm going down faster, fast enough, that means I actually might skip my uh, global minimum or the point that I'm actually looking for. However, if you use a very small learning rate, okay, that means it will take you forever to actually reach the global minimum. You will be moving very, very slowly until you reach that point. Okay, so let's dig a little bit deeper into the mathematics behind it. Let's assume that I have a straight line equation, y equals to b plus mx. 
x is the independent variable and y is the dependent variable. All what I have is just two parameters, b and m. And I'm trying to optimize the values of the parameters. That's what, all what I'm looking for. That's my goal. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, now please give me training data. Okay, I need data. So I'm going to collect data, which is x and y. And I'm going to start to train the, uh, the model. So what I'm going to do here, the model initially will generate predictions, will generate predicted values. And that will be my y hat. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract the model predictions minus the ground truth, minus the actual true labels that I'm looking for. So y hat minus y, that will generate an error signal. I'm going to take the error signal and I need to go back and update the network parameters or the M and B parameters. Okay. So what we do here is that we need to formulate what we call it a cost function. So the cost function is simply a function that we try to minimize. I just want to minimize it as much as possible. So in this case, the cost function, I'm going to select it as follows. I'm going to select the error, which is y hat. That's my model predictions, which is what I have here, minus yi, and that's the actual true output. That's my ground truth. I'm going to subtract the model predictions minus the ground truth. I'm going to square it up, so that will be squared. And when I do squaring, that means I'm just removing the sign in here. It's, you know, if it's above or below, it doesn't really matter. I'm just squaring it up to remove the sign. I'm going to sum that up. So I'm going to sum up all the errors for every single point in my training data. Maybe if I have 10 points, I'm summing up the error for every single point that I have. And then I'm going to divide by the overall number of samples, which is n. So that's what we call it a cost function. Simply, I'm just saying, OK, that's the overall summation of all my squared error. And all what I need to do is to find the optimal values for m and b is to minimize that error as much as I can. Now I have a function, and I want it to just minimize it. Just please go ahead and try to find the minimum value for that function. And that's essentially what we do when it comes to gradient descent algorithm. So what I'm going to do, again, I'm going to formulate a loss function, or we'll call it a cost function. And let's assume that maybe I started here. On the y-axis, I have the sum of squared residuals. Think of a residual as the error. Now I have the sum of squared errors. And here I have all the different combinations of the B and M parameters. So M and B might be like 2 and 1, might be like 4 and 5, might be whatever value. And let's assume that we started here, for example. So this is the how the algorithm works. First, we have to formulate the loss function, which is what we have here. Second, I need to calculate the gradient or the derivative of the loss function. So I'm going to say, OK, please obtain the partial derivative of my loss with respect to my weights. OK, so when I say weights, that means M and B. It might be any value, OK? So I'm obtaining the derivative first. That will be the first step. The second step, I'm going to pick random values for weight M and B and substitute. So I'm going to substitute in there. And then I'm going to take that gradient that I just calculated, and I'm going to multiply it by a learning rate. So again, as I mentioned, learning rate will indicate how aggressive you want to update the weights which means here, once I calculate the gradient, maybe I can need to maybe multiply it by 2, for example. Maybe I want to make it a little bit aggressive. So that means I'm increasing the learning rate. I'm taking the gradient and multiplying it by a number, by, a, by 2 or by a factor, or maybe 1.5 and so on. Or I can take the gradient and maybe lower it a little bit. Maybe I will multiply it by 0.1 or maybe 0.01, and that will be my learning rate. So, and that will give me my step size. Once I have my step size, I can take that and then I can subtract it minus the old parameters or old weights to give me my new parameters or my new weights. And that's basically how the algorithm works. Every time I'm going to go, I'm going to start here, I'm going to calculate the gradient, and then I'm going to take the gradient, multiply it by the learning rate, and then subtracted from the old parameters or old weights and that will give me new weights or new parameters and then I'm gonna maybe go down here to this point calculate again the gradient and then I'm going to do the same thing 
Okay, after I calculate the gradient, multiply by learning rate, and that will give me new parameters. And I keep doing that over and over again until I reach po a point where I minimized my loss or the sum of squared residuals. And that's essentially how gradient descent algorithm works in a nutshell. Please note that there's a lot, of, again, of additional math behind the scenes. I just want to give you the intuition from a very high level. And I highly recommend that you guys maybe uh, uh, look it up if you want to dig a little bit deeper into the uh, mathematics behind gradient descent. So now it's time for a mini challenge. I want you guys to tell me what happened when you set the learning rate to the extremes. Maybe a very small value or maybe a very large value. Actually, we covered that in this lecture. But the, the mini challenge here is how can we, I would say, achieve the best of both worlds? How can I tune it somehow to kind of, you know, like come up with something in between, okay? There are a lot of techniques out there, so I highly recommend that you guys go ahead, do a little bit of, of Google search, and try to answer the mini challenge. Please go ahead, pause the video, and I will see you guys after the challenge. All right, I hope you guys were able to figure out the challenge. If you scroll down here, I included the uh, mini challenge number eight solutions. So if you go here, if you click on this link, there's a really good um, uh, article here by Jason Brown Lee. So if you guys check it out, here it is discussing the learning rate and the actual impact of learning rate. And it's actually mentioning that the learning rate is one of the critical or most critical parameters when it comes to training artificial neural networks. If you test it or if you use a very small uh, learning, uh, learning rate, it will take you forever to converge. If you choose a very large learning rate, that means you might overshoot the, uh, the goal or my your minimum, uh, global minimum point, and you actually might have an unstable training because you are kind of, you know, like, again, increase the learning rate, you are overshooting the data that you're looking for. So what you could do instead is maybe you can try an adaptive learning rate, which means that the learning rate could actually change, could be adaptive based on your location on the curve. So for example, if you go back to my notebooks here, I can actually maybe start with a very large learning rate initially, so I can move actually faster. And once I get a little bit closer to my global minimum, I can actually slow the learning rate down so I can have fine tuning, for example, at some point. And that's essentially how can you achieve, I would say, the best of both worlds by using the adaptive learning rate. And there's a lot of other techniques. I highly recommend that you guys, again, read, read this. A lot of um, really interesting here points. So uh, please go ahead and check it out. So that's all what I have for task number seven. I hope you guys enjoyed it. In task number eight, we will understand the theory and intuition behind convolutional neural networks and ResNets. Please stay tuned and I will see you guys in the next lecture.